I thought I sounded odd on the on the microphone. Okay, everyone, welcome to today's uh, monthly librarians chat. Uh, the topic this month is selecting children's literature that accurately depicts Native experiences. Our guest presenter is Cyril Goodwin. Uh, he works at the Alaska State Library, and he's going to be providing his experience um, as a member of the Native Education Advisory Committee, which was formed in Juneau to make recommendations on four textbooks, which were part of a reading curriculum, um, which were later found to be inaccurate and offensive, and those four books were removed. Um, Sorrel is also an expert on children's literature, particularly as it relates to uh, multicultural and Native American experience, experiences, and so he'll be sharing uh, quite a bit of information on that topic. Um, just to help Sorrel out, if you guys would just share where you are on the Alaska map and it, give us a, a minute or two to let a few more people join today's webinar. So if you want to go ahead and put your initials or put a star where you are, it's going to um, be helpful to Sorrel. And I'm going to go ahead and change. We're going to be sharing uh, the little microphone and speaker here. So good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? Fantastic, thank you. I just um, wanted to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Sorrel Goodwin. Uh, my Clinket name is Yash Kandaets. I am uh, actually an Akwan Clinket uh, from the Juneau area. I am a Slay Navy, a Raven Dog Salmon, and I'm from the Big Dipper House. Um, currently, I have about 20 years um, of experience. Um, working in and around the ways in which uh, indigenous peoples are depicted um, in uh, not only media and popular culture, but in literature, arts, and also in historical documentation as well. Um, I am one of the, the few professionals in the state that has worked both in libraries, actually in libraries, archives, and museums uh, throughout my career. Uh, I started my career out in Chicago uh, as a NAGPRA uh, researcher at the Field Museum of Natural History, um, doing research um, in the early days of NAGPRA. Um, but started branching out from there, uh, going to get a degree in uh, anthropology and pursuing ethnohistory, uh, which then led me into, um, as an ethnohistorian, the ways in which um, indigenous peoples are depicted, uh, especially in the colonial or settler context, um, and how these depictions are either used or misused um, in such a way um, to maintain uh, unequal power relationships between indigenous peoples and settler populations. I've done quite a bit of work um, with the National Coalition on Racism in Sports and Media. I've done a lot of work with sports mascots, uh, the depictions of indigenous peoples in historical photography. I'm currently a librarian at the Alaska State Library Historical Collections, and we have one of the largest holdings of historical photographs um, in the state. And one of the uh, things we have done is to start looking at the ways in which uh, indigenous peoples in Alaska are depicted in these photographs, what these photographs mean, et cetera. So that's just a, a little bit of uh, with, with the work that I've done. I, I wanted to keep this as informal as possible today because I know we have a couple lines of inquiry today. I know there's one uh, people are sort of curious to hear about what happened uh, with the challenge curriculum here in the Juneau School District, but I also sort of wanted to go over uh, some uh, documentation that I have uh, that pertains to best practice um, and uh, ways of selecting materials for your libraries or for your curriculums um, that depict Native people um, in respectful and accurate ways. Um, I, I'm going to do another sound check. Can everyone, I noticed a few other people uh, joined. Is it, can everyone hear me okay? Fabulous. Um, I 
Okay. There has been um, a series of uh, publications that have been out since the 90s, mostly put out by Oyate. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with that organization. You'll see it at the end of my slides in my, my uh, links section. Um, but two uh, native educators and authors um, by the name of uh, Doris Seal and Beverly Slapen have been at the forefront for as far back as I can remember, but I'm, my, my memory of their materials goes back to the mid-90s. And the work they have done, uh, in, in my opinion, remains the gold standard for um, trying to uh, assess uh, children's literature um, when it comes to Native American themes and issues. Uh, and I think they continue to do some of the best work out there. So what I'm going to do today is go over um, some of their guidelines. Uh, you can find this set of guidelines in different forms online. Um, there is a 30-page version of everything that I'm going to be going over today that you can purchase on the Oyate website. But you can also find it in the uh, publication that's currently up, uh, A Broken Flute, um, which is a uh, probably the newest publication to come from these two authors. And uh, both of these publications are really fabulous in that uh, they not only provide guidelines, um, but they also have book reviews. Um, they have uh, extensive chapters on things like the boarding school experience, which was a major issue that came up this past fall with some of the publications that the Juno School District wanted to include um, in, in its uh, new curriculum um, package. Uh, so they've been able to sort of isolate issues that they know have come up over and over again and dedicate entire chapters to those issues in these publications. Uh, and boarding schools is a big one um, for those who don't know. Uh, it continues to be a big one uh, in Native communities just because of the intergenerational effects that those schools had on our communities. Um, so I wanted to keep this informal, and I don't mind if somebody has a question to just type a question, even if I'm speaking. I, I um, want this to be informal, and I want it to be a conversation as much as possible. So if you have any questions, don't be shy. Um, go ahead and ask me, even if I'm in the middle of, um, of talking. Um, so what I'm going to do is go through these, uh, these best practice um, guidelines first, and then I'll follow that up with a little bit about uh, what some of our experiences were here in the Juno School District. And like I said, if you have a question, um, go ahead and ask it, even if I'm in the middle of, of, of speaking. Hello. <laughs> How to tell the difference. Um, the Oyate website has a version of this. It's a much shorter version than what you're going to see here. Uh, but they also have the 30-page um, sort of mini version of these guidelines. You can also find it in through Indian Eyes, which was the cover that you just saw uh, before this slide. And um, for some reason, it doesn't show up in Broken Flute, but Broken Flute has so many other wonderful uh, resources for people to use, including reflections from educators, parents, and Native students um, about the positive and the negative effects of of literature um, in their uh, experiences. I think it's important to point out at this point that you know literature, like any art form, um, comes out of the society uh, that it's grounded in. Um, so uh, literature, the arts, um, scholarship, all of these things come out of whatever um, you know sociocultural. Uh, uh, and historical realities uh, exist at the time. So I think it's important to point out that none of these things exist in a vacuum. Problems that you might see in children's literature uh, are going to be reflected in other segments of a society, whether it's in popular culture or in scholarship, um, uh, so that these uh, concerns that, that many of us have with the way Native people are depicted in children's literature extend out to popular culture, um, to media, to entertainment, to scholarship. Uh, and I think it's important to 
keep that in mind that um, none of these issues exist in a vacuum, and they in fact are informed in both directions by whatever is going on in a society at any given time, including the ways in which uh, native issues are being dealt with politically, um, whether it's at the local, state, or federal government, or even internationally um, with uh, bodies like the United Nations and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. You will find a lot of these same concerns reflected at the international level as well. So. Um, how to tell the difference is sort of the gold standard, I think. I will, I'm just going to go through this and read through them and then provide commentary where needed. There are many sections of this, of these guidelines that really do speak for themselves. But for the ones that I think uh, need to be expanded upon, I will. And I will also um, try to tie them back into some of my experiences as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, begin now. Okay. Since the realities of native lifeways are almost completely unknown to outsiders, it is often very difficult for them to evaluate children's books about American Indians, and I will add Alaska Natives and Pacific Islanders in there. For this reason, we have compiled these criteria in the hope that they will make it easier for a teacher, parent, librarian, or student to choose non-racist and undistorted books about the lives and histories of indigenous peoples. As you may immediately notice, some of the choices in our guide are blatant, others are more subtle. Few books are perfect. When looking at books about Native peoples, and perhaps the most important questions to ask are, is this book truthful? Is this book respectful? Is there anything in this book that would embarrass or hurt a Native child? Is there anything in this book that would foster stereotypical thinking uh, in a non-Indian child? We and I hope that this guide is useful to you. Um, the first one seem obvious, but you'd be surprised how much more complicated these issues are. Um, picture books for younger children, uh, ABC books where letters uh, represent um, not only indigenous peoples, but any sort of ethnicity um, to me seems problematic. Um, various, you know, the very stereotypical um, depictions of indigenous peoples uh, that you see. Um, in both of these pictures. You still run into, even in a lot of modern authors, you would think at this point in, in history we would have sort of moved past um, the, the propensity for uh, putting these sort of issues out there. I think the second one in particular uh, for me resonates. Indian, the Indian wears bright colors and he likes to live outdoors. Um, obviously problematic. Um, it's always interesting to me that when, at least in North America, when Indian or anything to do with Indians is depicted, especially in popular culture, there's sort of the stereotypical Plains uh, Indian um, depiction. And of course, you see this also in popular culture as well, the, the headdresses. Um, in some of my work with sports mascots, that's something that came up over and over and over again, is that sort of the the default um, depiction of uh, Native peoples in North America is always sort of based on a sort of stilted version of Plains Indian um, regalia, etc. Uh, more picture books, uh, counting books. Are you counting Indians or any other group of people? Uh, would seem obvious to most folks, but you'd be surprised. Um, how these things come up from time to time. Um, I have one child in college at the University of Oregon, and I have one in middle school. And in, even in their, um, even in their uh, time in school, um, we've had to confront these issues in the classroom a number of times. Our children shown playing Indian. Uh, well, I'm an Indian, and Indians can ride. It says, this is an interesting dynamic, and it's one that we come across all the time. Um, I like to refer to it as red face, um, sort of a play on, on the, the term black face. Um, I think for most Native people, um, dressing up and, and wearing paint and feathers and things of that nature, really in our minds, uh, it, it is the same thing as painting your face black. Um, and so we generally refer to it as red face. So any depictions of red face generally 
for us will raise um, red flags. We have had recently, um, just in my oldest daughter's high school uh, time at the high school here, we had two student plays. One was uh, The Music Man, and the other one was Peter Pan. And in both of those plays, um, there was extensive use of, of red face. Um, when my oldest daughter went to go see Music Man with her then boyfriend, um, she got up and walked out. So at least in my opinion, <laughs> we must have done something right um, in, in teaching her what we find to be uh, offensive and not so much. So these sorts of things still happen. Um, more picture books, animals dressed as Indians. Um, uh, ridiculous names based on, again, sort of stereotypical uh, uh, depictions of especially lower 48 uh, native groups, uh, use of, of their names. The one thing with animals dressed up as Indians, that's a bit more complicated. You'll find in a lot of the, the better um, children's literature for native, uh, that deal with native subjects, you will find um, some stories um, where animals are wearing uh, the regalia of uh, whatever group is telling the story. Um, in a lot of uh, native uh, people's belief systems, um, it's a very uh, thin veil that separates the, the um, so-called animal world from the so-called human world. And of course, in our traditional belief systems, um, it was possible for uh, those beings to cross into each other's uh, worlds, and um, so that's when you have to be real careful with. I'm, I always look at who wrote the book. Um, so if there are animals that are are dressed in in native regalia, if it's coming from the culture, um, you you will find that it's generally depicted very differently than in this this. Uh, picture here, I believe, I believe it's from a Maurice Sednak um, book. So that's one that can be a bit more nuanced. Look at the context, look at who wrote it, are, are both good things to keep in mind. Stereotypes, this is another big one, um, and it's another one that I think is important to pay attention to. Are native peoples portrayed as savages or primitive craftspeople or simple tribal people now extinct? Um, looking for the um, the sort of myth of the vanishing Indian um, that was in vogue um, in the 19th and 20th centuries in particular, especially right on through the early 20th century. You see it in a lot of historical photographs, um, this whole idea that you know native peoples were, were uh, on the verge of extinction or were going to be extinct. Um, so that's one to, to uh, keep an eye out for. Um, a better depiction would be uh, native people shown as human beings, members of highly defined and complex societies uh, with families and, and um, functioning governments and uh, things of that nature um, is always the better approach. I usually point people, uh, when they ask me uh, for examples of that, I point them in the direction of the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, and the influence that they uh, had on the development of the United States, especially um, in the area of government, in the area of the United States Constitution. Um, I just use that as a real obvious example, and I find that it's one that resonates with a lot of Americans um, for obvious reasons. Uh, stereotypes. Are native societies oversimplified and generalized? Are native people all one color or one style? And uh, they use the example, and what would America have been without the Indians themselves with their magnificent feathered headdresses, their colorful blankets, their bows and arrows and wampum belts, etc.? I would add um, their systems of democratic government, <laughs> especially in the case of the Iroquois Confederacy. Or are native societies presented as separate from each other with each culture, language, religion, and dress unique? That's a big one, especially in the work that I've done with Northwest Coast, uh, with children's literature that deals with Northwest Coast indigenous societies. Um, uh, one you see all the time is people plopping you know, totem poles down uh, 
in societies where there weren't any, uh, the mixing and matching of different um, styles of Northwest Coast art, and of course the, our artistic styles vary widely from the southern coast, from Washington State to Yakutat, uh, you will see very different styles in the artwork. Um, so when all these things are jumbled together, uh, it becomes problematic um, and becomes uh, a form of stereotyping. I did send you all uh, a paper I wrote about ass assessing Northwest Coast uh, Native children's literature in particular, um, uh, so I hope you like it. More stereotypes. Um, art is a mishmash of generic Indian designs, um, or the better approach, uh, attention paid to accurate, appropriate design and color, clothes, dress, houses, drawn with careful attention to um, detail. This bottom illustration, um, I can tell right away from looking at it that it comes from um, the Aquasasni Notes um, series of publications. Uh, that are put out by the Mohawk Nation in Akwesasne, and they, as far as best practice, um, contemporary Native education is concerned, uh, I feel that the Mohawks have been at the cutting edge for a very long time. Loaded words. Are there insulting overtones to the um, language in the book, racist adjectives used to refer to Indian peoples. A huge Indian came forward. He was over six feet tall, his half-naked body superbly muscled, his long black hair hung loosely at his waist, his brutal face gleamed with malice, and under his slow brush, uh, his eyes shone like a wolf. Um, pretty obvious where the problems are there. Um, I'll let you read the other, um, and for the sake of time, uh, read the other ones in there. But you can see the difference in, in language. I am often confronted in my work, uh, in all three of my disciplines, both in library work, museum work, and archives work, I'm always confronted with the word squaw. And um, there's an ongoing debate about what that means. Um, but irregardless for me and for a lot of other Native people, irregardless of what the original meaning or context was, um, if, if anyone was to refer to any of my female relatives as such, um, there would be a problem. Uh, tokenism. Are Native peoples depicted as stereotypically alike or do they look just like white people with brown faces? Um, you see that a lot in children's books. Um, that's a really hard one to combat just because a lot of times, um, as you well know, a lot of times the writer of the book and the artist have very little interaction with each other. Sometimes a contract is given and they know how these large publishing companies work. Um, two contracts will be awarded completely separately. A lot of times folks are not talking to each other. Um, and I think best practice for publishers would be to make sure that um, uh, authors and illustrators work uh, a bit more closely together. I think that would go uh, a long ways in solving a lot of these problems. Um, or are Native people depicted as genuine individuals? Again, a, a wonderful um, illustration from one of the Akwesasne Notes publications. Distortion of history. This is a big one for me personally as an ethno-historian, but also as a native person. And it's, it's huge for me, as a matter of fact, and it's one that I have to struggle with all the time uh, in my professional life particularly, but sometimes in my private life as well. And it was a big, it was a big uh, issue with uh, the challenged curriculum this past fall. Um, I'll go ahead and read through this and then talk a bit more about um, how this can become a problem. Uh, is there a manipulation of words like victory, conquest, or massacre to justify Euro-American conquest of native homelands? Are native nations presented as being responsible for their own disappearance? Uh, is the U.S. government only trying to help? All of those came, all of those issues came up with, and you'll see, I, another PDF I sent you is actually Paul Berg. Um, his response 
uh, to these publications. Paul Berg is not only a dear friend, family friend of ours, but he's a colleague and an ally going back at least 20 years. Uh, so if you get a chance to read through his response to those, you'll see how all of these issues came to the fore over and over and over again. And right on through the, the several meetings that we had as the Native Advisory Group with the school district, um, it was a constant struggle to try to get um, school district um, administrators in particular to understand um, how um, uh, the manipulation, whitewashing, or um, censoring of history uh, does a, a disservice to to all involved, uh, not just Native students and teachers, but also non-Native students and teachers as well. Um, and I'm not totally convinced that we were completely successful in um, uh, trying to change the, the thinking in all of the school district's administrators, but we were successful in changing some people's uh, ways of looking at, at how the, the, the distortion of history um, can, can cause real harm. I, I know it's sort of in fashion uh, in a lot of um, sectors, especially in academia, to sort of put the postmodernist um, stamp on just about everything that we do. Those of us who do indigenous history for a living and have a vested interest in it really feel that postmodernism has no place in the way we approach Native history um, because ultimately at the end of the day it really only serves to maintain the status quo. Um, we all understand that there's nuances in in uh, any situation, including in doing uh, best practice historiography. But unfortunately, uh, postmodernism can be used uh, as a way to hide from some of the, um, uh, how should I say, um, less uh, happy versions of history. Postmodernism, that's a very broad term. My understanding of it, at least in doing history work, is that uh, you can never really know the truth for sure. Uh, this is sort of a, a it's, it's the best that I can put it without it turning into um, uh, a, a confusing mess. But that you can never know the truth for sure, that everyone's, everyone's truths are sort of equal and on the same footing with each other. And because you can't really ever know the truth, um, you should just put everything out there and, and let people decide. The problem with that is what it never seems to take into, into consideration uh, on the back end. On the front end, to say that sounds fine. But on the back end, when there's power dynamics in play between those who have power and those who don't, um, a lot of times, uh, any society's default position, whether it's in the service of patriotism or in the service of triumphalism, or I guess the word that you hear nowadays is exceptionalism, um, a lot of these truths will be sort of harnessed by one of those three tendencies. And those are very human tendencies. Those aren't tendencies that belong to one one ethnic group or nation. All human beings have a tendency to to, <laughs> to to feel one of those three things when it comes to their truth. Um, but when the power dynamic is unequal, as it is still uh, in this country between indigenous peoples and the settler society, those with more power, their truths will still get more airtime. Um, so at that point, a lot of the assumptions of postmodernism, in my opinion, sort of crumble under their own weight. I know that was a lot, but it's. Um, I, I would encourage all of you, if you have more questions, to contact me, because uh, I've got lots of other um, research and um, you know scholarly papers that deal with this. Postmodernism is a big one in the museum world, and it's one that I struggle against all the time. Um, but uh, it's it's um, one of those things. There's been several Native museum professionals who have pointed out how sort of the postmodernist ethic found its way even into the National Museum of the American Indian, and what a shame that was, uh, because it did sort of um, 
it did sort of lessen the the uh, opportunities for real honest dialogue in a lot of those those museum exhibits. Um, best practice is history put in the proper perspective: the native struggle for self-determination and sovereignty against the Euro-American drive um, for conquest. Um, in the sake of time, I'm going to keep going. Um, uh, more distortions of history. Does the story encourage children to believe that native peoples accept, accepted defeats uh, passively, or does the story show the ways in which native people actively resisted the invaders? And of course, there's many different ways to resist any group of people who have been colonized or subjugated or marginalized knows this, and violence and violent resistance is just was always just one option. There's a gentleman by the name of James Scott, who I believe is a sociologist, who's written several books. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's interested about the hidden transcripts, about the many other ways in which um, colonized or marginalized people use language as a weapon. Uh, I can't think of any other term uh, in which to carry out resistance. Um, uh, James Scott is his name, and uh, his books are fascinating about all the different forms of resistance. And um, for, for me, as a Native person, reading his books, immediately all of the different um, forms of, of, of resistance that he talks about um, uh, resonated with me instantly, because I've seen my own family um, undertake these, these forms. Um, I think this also goes into who's, who we see as heroes and villains. Um, in a lot of Native communities, we see those folks who resisted you know, colonialism as heroes, whereas a lot of times in the dominant or the settler society, they will be depicted as villains. Um, are Native uh, heroes only the people who, in some way or another, are believed to have aided Europeans in the conquest of their own people? I run into this all the time, not just in the historical context, but in the modern context as well. Um, uh, Squanto, Sacagawea, people like that, uh, not to, uh, not bad-mouthing these individuals, but it does make you wonder when only these sort of folks are held up as the the sort of uh, as sort of the good Indians and people like Tecumseh and Katlian and and uh, you know Captain Jack among the Modoc in Northern California are held up as the bad Indians. This still happens, unfortunately, uh, even in some of our modern political struggles, and it's really unfortunate um, because I think any human being, if they were to put themselves in the position of the resistors, if they were to say, what if this happened to me? What if this happened to my family, to my community? How would I react? I always encourage people to take that approach, because I think you would arrive at the very same place that someone like a Tecumseh would. Um, or are Native uh, heroes those who are admired because of what they have done for their own people? Uh, and that can be. Um, not just resistance, but um, providing uh, food, providing shelter, um, things of that nature. Um, all good things to keep in mind. Lifestyles. Are native cultures presented in a condescending manner? Are there paternalistic distinctions between them and us? Um, I'll just read this after, under here because I think this is a good one. And, in our half of the world, which we call the Western Hemisphere, there was no civilization 500 years ago except in Mexico and Peru, where people built cities with houses of stone and knew how to carve statues and, and paint statues. Um, these, of course, were the closest thing uh, in the Americas representing you know, states uh, in, this, in more of a, a Western or European um, way of looking at the world. Um, I have to laugh because I am I am married to a person uh, who is a descendant of, of the Inca. Um, her family is from Ecuador, um, and we often talk about um, uh, how these civilizations in Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, uh, although they reach this really high level of of of, 
um, development with their civilizations. Ultimately, when the European invasion happened, it actually worked against them. Um, so much so that um, really the, the reason for the fall of the Inca Empire is that the, the uh, conquistadors were able to pit two half-brothers against each other, is my understanding. Um, and of course, you know, divide and conquer will always weaken any uh, people's opportunity for resistance, and uh, the Inca Empire fell apart. Um, or is the focus on respect for native peoples and understanding of the sophistication and complexity of their societies? Um, again, all of these approaches require a bit more uh, intellectual rigor and doing the hard work of research. But I think if authors and other folks are interested in putting out something that is a true benefit to society, then they will do the added work and put a bit more uh, intellectual rigor into their finished product. Are native people discussed in the past tense only supporting the vanished Indian myth? Is the past unconnected to the present? This is an ongoing um, problem not only in children's literature but in a lot of other aspects in our society. It's something that museums uh, have to struggle with all of the time. Um, and of course, historically, museums have sort of trapped Native people in the past. Uh, but again, if you were to talk to some of these children's authors, where was their first, where was their first um, interaction with Native peoples? Well, a lot of them will tell you, I went to this museum, I went to that museum, and uh, it had a great um, influence on me as a child or a young adult. And they're absolutely correct. I'm sure it was a very positive um, experience. And I think museums have a very important role to play in our society. Unfortunately, um, historically, what a lot of these folks were encountering was a version of Native people's histories and cultures frozen in time. Um, is the continuity of cultures represented with values, religions, morals? Uh, and an outgrowth of the past and connected to the present. This is an important one, um, especially with a lot of modern um, literature that's coming out that um, although we live in this dominant society, uh, a lot of us, our daily lives, minute by minute, are still constantly informed by not only the worldviews, but the values and, and um, and cultures of, of those who came before us. Is a society portrayed in a distorted or limited way? Are religions described as superstitions with backward and primitive connotations? Um, this, is, this is a big one. It's one that you run into still all the time. Um, you still, unfortunately, see terms like witch doctor used and things of that nature. Um, you'd be surprised how um, indigenous spirituality is still used and misused, not only in children's literature, but in, in uh, uh, nonfiction as well. Um, the sort of um, the uh, sort of plastic medicine man phenomenon that you see uh, uh, coming out of the New Age movement, where people um, uh, adopt what they see as a version of, of native spirituality, and in fact by doing so, just sort of um, you know, distort it beyond, um, uh, beyond recognition. Um, of course, outside of the, the entire issue of, of taking something that's, that's not yours. Um, are Indian religions and traditions described accurately in the context of their civilizations? Um, this is a very important one. I remember one time uh, I took an art history course at Northeastern Illinois University, and the art history instructor um, went into a piece of, of, of uh, writing that was put out by the conquistadors about how the Aztecs were sacrificing 25,000 people a day. And I asked her to show me the archaeological proof of mass human sacrifice, which is something you would find in the archaeological record. And she was not able to answer uh, my question. Um, there was definitely human sacrifice in the Aztecs' traditional uh, way of doing things. But rather than looking at it uh, uh, on its own terms, there was this 
uh, usage of what amounts to, at the time, Spanish propaganda. Um, but that's just one, one example of many. Uh, is there an ethnocentric Western focus on material objects such as baskets, pottery, and rug? This is rugs. This is another big one for me, both um, not only as a librarian but also as a museum professional. A lot of times, um, I think sometimes people will want to admire the arts, and of course, our arts are beautiful. Um, but uh, to want to just deal with a material object and not deal with the people who made that object, uh, in my opinion, is very problematic. And I still run into this all of the time. Um, it's sort of this dynamic of, well, we love your art, but we really don't want to have much to do with you. Um, does the writer show any understanding of the relationship between material and, and uh, non-material aspects of life? Um, Traditional clinket art is a perfect example of this. You're looking at this physical object covered with all of these beautiful designs, but in fact what these beautiful designs represent is, is thousands of years of, of history. Uh, it represents the entire um, history of the clan or the clan house. Um, so while you can admire it for its aesthetics, it's so much more. And there's a completely there's a tangible and an intangible aspect, especially to, to a lot of the art here on the Northwest Coast, I think, that a lot of people are not always aware of. Uh, and I think I go into that a bit into the, in the article that I wrote. Um, are Native people shown as relentlessly ecological? That's a big one. Um, I would just say that uh, in, as an ethno-historian, the way I've traced that development is the transition from depicting native people as savages. And you'll find that throughout history, generally, we were depicted as savages during the time when we were still able to resist. And once our ability to resist had ceased because of disease, because of military um, actions, or because of, of uh, the sort of uh, last stages of colonialism, then the uh, depiction of native people as the noble savage um, suddenly becomes the norm, and um, you know, um, spiritual um, good in the woods, um, and relentlessly ecological. I think is the way, is the way they term it in here. Uh, from an ethno um, history point of view, I have found that the noble savage stereotype always comes after uh, a people's ability to resist has been taken away. In other words, you're safely in the past. Now you have all these positive aspects that we want to emulate. Um, and it's, very, it's a very bizarre dynamic. Um, are Native societies described as coexisting with nature in a delicate um, balance? Uh, again, so a lot of this, I think, comes down to nuance. A lot of times, nuance is lost. And I know children's literature doesn't always lend itself well to that. but. Um, I think people can try. Dialogue, do people speak in either a sort of early jawbreaker or in the oratorical style of the no noble savage? That's fairly obvious, I think. Um, one of the reasons why my daughter got up and walked out of Music Man is because there's a whole scene where that's the case. Um, I like to call it you know, sort of the Tonto talk, but you still see that come up from time to time. Or do the people use language with the consummate and articulate skill of those who come from an oral tradition? Again, um, as a clinket, I know that our ancestors, and including a lot of our modern leaders, are masters of oratory. And anyone who has stayed up all night at a kui, or what people call a potlatch, knows um, not only are our people good orators, but they can do it for a really long time. <laughs> Uh, looks for, look for standards of success in modern times are Indian people portrayed as childlike and helpless. Does a white authority figure, pastor, social worker, teacher know better than Native people themselves what is good for them? Are Indian children better off away from their families? Or are Native adults seen as mature individuals who work hard and make sacrifices in order to take care of their families and for the well-being of their people? I, I'm going to speed through these last few slides because I just looked at the time. 
uh, more standards of success. The native people in their communities contrast unfavorably with the norm of white middle class suburbia. Well, why can't those people just be more like us? Well, I still hear that all the time, and it is a problem. Um, or are native people in their communities seen as their own cultural norm? Um, a lot of times when people look at the social problems, especially in communities of color, um, they see the entire culture is defective. Well, what's wrong with those people? Whereas when uh, somebody from the dominant society or the settler society makes a mistake or screws up, it's seen as, well, that individual screwed up. Um, not as often do you see, well, there's, they come from a defective culture. Unfortunately, we still see that um, not only um, in politics, but also in mass media as well. Um, does it take white standards for native peoples to get ahead? Um, or are native values of cooperation, generosity, sharing, honesty, and courage seen as integral to growth and development? Uh, the role of women. Are women completely subservient in men? Do they do all the work while the men loll around waiting for the next hunt? Um, you see the use of the word squaw in the example beneath. Or are women portrayed as the integral and respected part of Native societies that they really are? Uh, the role of elders. Are elders treated as an indispensable burden upon their people to be abandoned in times of trouble? Or are the elders treated as loved and valued custodians of the people's history, culture, and life ways? Uh, the effects on a child's self-image. This one sometimes is a little harder to gauge, but I think it's one that educators in particular really need to take the time to try and learn. And I know it's easier said than done sometimes. Um, but it's important to ask these questions before materials are presented to children, especially Native children. Is there anything in the story that would embarrass or hurt a Native child? Are there one or more positive role models with which a Native child can identify? You know, I've, I've watched my own children struggle. And of course, they, they, they come from a politically conscious household. But even my children have to struggle about when they say something, how they say something. Are they going to be retaliated against by the teacher or by their, their peers for saying what they had to say? Um, so that's a constant, that's a constant um, struggle, and it's, it's a hard one. But I would encourage, if nothing else, for educators and librarians to ask themselves these questions. Uh, authors or illustrators' background. Is the background of the author and illustrator devoid of the qualities that enable them to write about Native peoples in an accurate and respectful manner? Is there an ethnocentric bias which leads to distortions or omissions? Or is there anything in the author's and illustrator's background that qualifies them to write about Native peoples? Do their perspective strengthen to work? Uh, you'll see in the paper that I wrote about Northwest Coast um, children's literature that what we're not saying is that non-Native people can't write children's literature dealing with Native issues. But what we are saying is that if you are going to, then do it the right way. Consult with the communities that you're writing about. Um, do your research. Do the work. Uh, undertake the sort of intellectual rigor that is necessary to do it the right way. Because if not, uh, what you end up with is a uh, inferior um, finished product that does more harm than good. Uh, at the end of the footnotes from where the quotes um, uh, came from throughout this, this guide, um, I put this book up here. People often ask me, well, as a kid, what was a children's book that you will always remember? And I would have to say it would have to be this one. Um, the People Shall Continue. My mom, um, who is not Clinkett, um, but is actually Jewish and Huguenot, bought this book for me. And it's one I'll always remember. It deals with our history, with North American indigenous history and all of its complexities and all of its nuances uh, very well. And it was written by Simon Ortiz, who was, I think, one of the first native national poet laureates, maybe. Uh, I remember he, uh, he's no longer with us, but um, both him and the illustrator did a wonderful uh, job with this book. So people often ask me, what's a children's book that you remember from your childhood that really represents all of these standards that, that you often talk about? And the people shall continue is that book for me. A uh, few lists of resources. 
uh, by no means exhaustive. Um, Oyate is wonderful. And it has book reviews. It has resources you can purchase. It's got an extensive list of links. American Indians and Children's Literature, run by um, several native librarians, another wonderful website that, that has uh, book reviews, um, news stories, uh, and other resources for folks. The American Indian Library Association, same thing. Um, uh, resources, reviews, um, any of those folks, if you were to ask them for advice, would be more than happy to, to give it. The Alaska Native Knowledge Network, uh, coming out of UAF, is another wonderful resource. Uh, has a lot of best practice guides uh, for not just curriculum, but for also doing research in Native communities. Uh, another wonderful uh, resource. Native Appropriations is fabulous. It's run by one individual. I think she's a young um, Cherokee college student. She might have graduated by now, but she tackles not just literature, but the depictions of indigenous peoples uh, in fashion, in media, in sports. Um, it's just it's a, it's a blog. It's a blog format. And she is just uh, fabulous. She does an amazing job. And even when she's taking a tremendous amount of heat for what she does, she just keeps on going. And I give her nothing but credit for that. National Coalition Against Racism in Sports and Media, I encourage everyone to visit this website. These are folks that are working nationally. They do a lot of work with, sport, with um, sports mascots, but they do so much more um, as well. I see that we're almost out of time, and I apologize for that. It's a lot to go over. I was wondering if anyone had any questions. I know it was a lot to cover in a very short amount of time. Again, I encourage anyone who wants to contact me, don't be shy. You can contact me at that email that Julie put up. Uh, if anyone had any questions about, um, I guess at this point, the, um, the issues we dealt with here in the Juno School District. Um, if not, um, I guess we can call it a day. <laughs> I, I did want to report that um, not only are the uh, challenge materials no longer being used in Gastineau Elementary, but my understanding is through Senator Egan that, um, or through Representative Egan, sorry, um, that the materials are now being replaced in all uh, schools in, in the Juno School District uh, where they were going to be used, which I think is an amazing victory for those of us who work towards uh, that being the case. Um, the materials will be replaced by materials that are both being uh, produced locally um, by Gold Belt Heritage Foundation, the Alaska Heritage Institute, and some other um, native educators who do work in the Juno School District, um, augmented with uh, other outside resources that are of a much better um, quality than, than the original ones that were selected. Um, so I'll wait a few more minutes to see if any folks have any questions. For anyone who's interested in other um, scholarly articles and journals, you can contact me and I will um, share those with you gladly. Um, there are, you know, you can find, um, there are regional, a lot of times there are regional clearing houses, sometimes run by a consortium of native groups in that region uh, who will get together um, to publish materials. A lot of times you'll find um, uh, cultural centers or heritage foundations, like some of the ones that we have here, uh, publishing good material. Sea Alaska Heritage Institute is a great one. Uh, but then some of the other um, groups, like Oyate, um, publishes really amazing 
books. Um, but the other thing to do is to go to some of these resources, even for ones that are published outside of a, a, of a native publishing house. It's good to go and look and see what the reviews are uh, with organizations like OYATE, American Indians and Children's Literature, and also those two books that I recommended. Um, those are good good places to go to see what people are saying about about these. Uh, and if you have any questions, it's always good to uh, you can contact any of these organizations and run a title by them and say, eh, you know, I'm having some second thoughts about this. What do you think? Uh, I noticed on the summer reading program manual that one of the suggested activities was making the dream catcher. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily racist. I think it's kind of um, uh, it's kind of stereotypical, you know. I think the dream catchers. I I lived in Chicago for almost 10 years. Uh, my wife was the first one born in the United States, and she was born and raised there. And I dealt um, a lot with the Chicago urban Indian community, which consisted mostly of folks from Midwestern um, native nations, uh, Ojibwe's, um, Ho Chunks. Um, uh, some of these other uh, folks from that region who do use the dream catcher traditionally. And um, it's one of those things that I would avoid just because it is part of their traditional spirituality. If you want to use the term religion, that's fine. Um, I just think it's kind of odd to take something that is a part of someone else's spiritual tradition and sort of use it as a craft project. Um, uh, I don't know if I'd call that racist or just confused. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Well, engaging with indigenous communities, helping them find, uh, you know, the resources through, you know, grant funding or things of that nature, putting them in touch with other, you know, native authors. There's a ton of native authors out there. Um, both in children's literature and in adult fiction and in you know scholar in the scholarly world, you know I I know um, uh, somebody like Sherman Alexie who's a native person from the Northwest. Uh, although he can be a controversial character, I absolutely love the guy because he writes. Um, his people's history from his own point of view, and he expands it outside of the reservation context. He's written several books recently about uh, the experiences of urban Native people in Seattle, for example. Um, and, and I think that uh, expanding that that vantage point is really important as well. You know, there's more Alaska Natives, I think, in Anchorage now than there are in any of the villages. So what does that mean? What does that mean for Alaska Native people? Um, I think we can all encourage each other to, to think more broadly about what even indigenous literature is. And I think Sherman Alexie, he's this one person that jumps into my mind as a, as a perfect example of someone who's ex pushed the boundaries of what indigenous literature is. Yeah, Julie just asked me what someone should do when you inadvertently um, offend someone. Um, we're all human beings. We all can hurt each other's feelings, I think, trying to mend those relationships and talking about what you could do differently next time, I think, is the best way. Um, we're all human beings at the end of the day, and we all uh, have feelings, and we all um, want to feel good about the community that we live in and the relationships that we have with the people that we share our society with. Collaborate with small schools, talk to children and high school students. Absolutely. The importance of, of writing. I know sometimes, I'm just going to say it, I know it's not always a popular sentiment, but a lot of times I've run into some folks, especially young folks, who say, well, ah, you know, reading and writing, you know, that's a white man's thing. Um, I don't think that argument, I think in this day and age, I think it's it's a self-defeating, I think, um, convincing, especially young Native people, that actually literacy and reading and writing is a tool. Now, whether it's a tool for telling your story, whether it's a tool for recording your people's history, or whether it's a tool for 
liberation. It's a tool and it's one that needs to be used. You know, our people and all people throughout history, no matter where they were on Earth, have always integrated new technologies and new ideas into their into their societies. And this is the this is me, the anthropologist, talking now. Um, it, it's it's human nature to integrate new technologies and ideas. You can do the remix and make them your own, um, but to close off that as a as a potential tool, I think is is something that we need to get away from. Um, and I still run into to folks who feel that way all the time, and I very gently and diplomatically try to convince them otherwise, um, because literacy and the ability to read and write and read and write well is a tool um, uh, for for us being able to move forward into the future. Truly. Left. Oh, somebody left. No, I think that's it. Well, it's two o'clock. I want to thank everyone for for coming um, to this webinar. And like I said, if you have any other questions, please don't be shy. I answer all my emails, and I am more than happy uh, to answer any of your questions or help you out with more. Um, uh, uh, direction as far as resources and getting the information that you need. Um, I, I am a librarian here and I do see that as part of my um, my job. Thank you everyone.